Hey, Joachim from Sabaton. Do you know what time it is? Hello, Indian Idol. No, I don't know what time it is. It's Sabaton history time! And it's all guns blazing! When people think of heavy metal, they think of black leather jackets, rivet-laced belts, howling motorcycles, and above all, loud, aggressive music. But of course, it didn't just magically start that way one day. Someone had to go out there and break the new ground, musically, culturally, sartorially, and one of those legendary bands was and is Judas Priest, with songs like Hellbent for Leather, Breaking the Law, and Painkiller, they've left an unforgettable stamp on the history of heavy metal. Judas Priest was originally founded back in 1969 in Birmingham. Yep, over 50 years ago, back in the 60s. Although no one from that original lineup was around long enough to play on any recordings. They did give the band its name, though, inspired by Bob Dylan's song, The Ballad of Frankie Lee and Judas Priest. Well, it was a different band renamed as well. Confusing? The very early years are, but the results were Al Atkins singing with guitarist Kenneth Downing and bassist Ian Hill. Oh, KK Downing, fine. They went through several drummers. This blues rock band had played a number of shows in the Midlands and had attracted a small following. But Atkins left in 1973, and singer Rob Halford, unsatisfied by his own band Hiroshima, and intrigued by Downing's determination to take Judas Priest all the way to the top, joined the band. It was a perfect match. Hiroshima's drummer John Hinch also came along. They would have several more drummers, though, over the rest of the decade. The mid-1970s were still the days of glam rock, of, of Top of the Pops, of Queen, of, of cowboy shirts and flared pants. Metal was a young, rather undefined genre whose groundwork was just being laid by bands like Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, and Led Zeppelin. Judas Priest signed with the small independent label Gull, and with the addition of Glenn Tipton as a second guitarist, they recorded their first album, 1974's Rock'n'Rolla, and it was a massive disappointment, especially for the band itself. It looked like shit and was everything but heavy metal, Halford would say in retrospect. The sound was lukewarm, the production half-hearted, and it received underwhelmed reviews from musical magazines. But, you know, while some bands enter music history with a bang, others have to gradually excel at what they do. The band's second album, Sad Wings of Destiny, in 1976, became something of a modern classic. The title alone raised eyebrows. Halford, who was writing and would continue to write most of Priest's songs, took his inspiration from a variety of historical and science fiction literature. Musically, they began focusing on heavier riffs and more complex drums. The Ripper is a perfect example of early Priest metal. Sad Wings of Desire eventually charted, and after a successful tour, they were local celebrities. Sin After Sin, their major label debut on CBS, is a darker, more apocalyptic album, with songs about epic battles between gods, devils, and warriors. But Halford also began expressing personal feelings through his writing. The song Raw Deal was a hint to his closet homosexuality. All eyes hit me as I walked into the bar. Them steely leather guys were fooling with the denim dudes. A couple of cults played rough stuff. New York. Fire Island. Being gay was far from being generally accepted at the time, and certainly not in the rock scene. Halford's biggest fear was that the fans would turn their backs on Judas Priest because of it, or that the scandal would break the band apart. So he kept his homosexuality a secret for a large part of his career. But the suppressed feelings and the inevitable loneliness would eventually come to haunt and nearly destroy him. However, the major fear back in 1977 was that no one might actually care for their album. For by now, punk was the talk of the town. And seemingly every British magazine cover headlined nothing but punk, punk, and more punk. 
but with the marketing power of a major label behind it, the album made it easily into the charts. And after selling out the Apollo Victoria Theatre in London, they began their first of many U.S. tours. As supporting acts for the likes of Foreigner, Ted Nugent, and even Led Zeppelin, the still rather unknown Judas Priest, were suddenly playing in front of tens of thousands of people. Stained Class in 1978 had a heavier, darker sound. But also by 1978, the band began to undertake a radical image change. Turning their backs on the cowboy shirts of the 70s, they instead embraced the heavy leather biker culture of Marlon Brando in The Wild One. Halford would spring on stage, wearing his leather cap and riveted gloves, point a whip towards the front row. There was no heavy metal look really among the crowd back then. And people usually wore the same clothes they would have worn to see Rod Stewart or Elton John. But priest style caught on and more and more of the fans began adopting it. Musically, the band was in peak form. For years, it was a nonstop cycle of recording albums and going on tour. They were ready to take on the world. Killing Machine once more delivered the goods, cementing the band's new image as a sleek, unrelenting metal machine. They climbed the charts, they were seen on TV, with Halford driving his Harley onto the stage, delivering unmatchable, high-pitched, ring-wraith-like screams while Downing and Tipton unleashed unparalleled riffs and solos. Entering the 1980s, it was a golden age of heavy metal. New forms of sound engineering allowed better production and a heavier sound. The album British Steel was not only a commercial success, but a milestone in the band's career. Actually, Living After Midnight from that album was the first Priest song I ever heard on KLOL 101.1 radio in Houston, Texas, going to school in the mornings. Breaking the law, everybody knows. Heavily influenced by punk and the steam hammers of Midland's heavy industry, the song was a harsh critique against Thatcher's Britain, symbolizing the feeling of millions of young people caught somewhere between hopelessness and rebellion. British Steel cut into the music scene like the razor blade on its cover, delivering a rapid fire of hits. Together with groups like Iron Maiden, Def Leppard, and Saxon, the press hailed them as the new wave of British heavy metal. No album. Halford was soon writing tracks for the following albums from the deserts of Arizona, which he had made his home. Point of Entry, Screaming for Vengeance, and Defenders of the Faith became metal classics, and songs like, like Heading Out to the Highway were made to listen to while driving, while You've Got Another Thing Coming embodies classic priest themes of determination and willpower. But beyond that, the band was starting to run on autopilot. With sold out shows all over and heavy rotation on MTV, it was certainly the high point of their careers, but Halford himself was on a personal downward spiral, abusing alcohol and cocaine and still suppressing his whole sexual identity, which caused isolation that contributed to his substance abuse. He grew irritable and had serious issues recording for 1986's Turbo. His songwriting became sloppy, resorting to traditional rock and roll cliches the band had always avoided. In fact, it took a close encounter with death after mixing a bunch of sleeping pills with Jack Daniels that January for Halford to come to his senses. He's been sober since that day. Yet more trouble for the band was brewing though. In Washington, the PMRC, Parents Music Resource Center, and its co-founder, Tipper Gore, future Vice President Al Gore's wife, began singling out music that they thought obscene for America's youth. Judas Priest soon found themselves among the filthy 15. Although it definitely did not hurt album sales, it did put them on the radar of America's conservatives and evangelicals. 
Many see the 1990s as a gradual downfall of traditional heavy metal. New rock trends and metal genres were emerging as bands began to experiment with differing styles. Judas Priest, although a well-oiled metal machine at this point, had new competition. Thrash and grunge drew huge crowds. With Painkiller and new drummer Scott Travis, the band aimed at releasing their most powerful and intense album. For Halford, it was to be their Sgt. Peppers, a musical benchmark to really set themselves apart from the rest. But before the album could be released, yet another tragedy struck. Back in 1985, two young men in Nevada, after a night of heavy drugs and listening to stained class on repeat, had executed a suicide pact. Their parents and the U.S. conservative media began blaming the tragedy on the harmful influences of heavy metal in general and Judas Priest in specific. The band was sued over it in 1990, accused that in combination with alcohol and drugs, their music had influenced a hypnotizing effect on the teens and their songs had subliminal messages like, do it, that enticed them to suicide. The whole lawsuit was, of course, a farce. Yet the acquittal was not as clear-cut as one might imagine. It took a lot of time and nerve to convince the judge that Judas Priest's message was positive, and their songs had always been about the triumph of good over evil, or, or personal will over adversity. After that was settled, Painkiller could finally be released, and indeed became one of their most acclaimed, if not the most acclaimed, albums. Planets were left devastated and mankind left on its knees in the wake of this masterpiece. And that's good writing, isn't it? That's good writing, huh? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Yeah? Okay. However, instead of working on a sequel, the band was breaking apart. The decades of touring and recording had left Judas Priest exhausted, especially creatively, and tensions had grown within the band. Rob Halford's decision to release material outside Priest was the final impetus to him leaving the band. It seemed like the end. Well, it kind of was for a couple of years. In 1996, Tipton, Hill and Downing decided to continue the band, but without Rob Halford. But you know, it's not just that Judas Priest had to replace a singer, they had to replace a metal god. Impossible as that was, one man came actually kind of close, Tim Owens. Owens was a massive Priest fan and even played in a Priest tribute band called British Steel. Many high profile singers were on the Halford replacement list, but after Owens performed The Ripper, the band had found their replacement. Many fans hardly felt a difference between Halford and the vocal performance of Tim Ripper Owens. You want to rip me apart for that sentence in the comments? Go ahead. But I was around. I remember. This lineup released Jugulator and Demolition, but, but, but was it Priest? The strong influence of bands like Pantera were undeniable, and stylistically these albums were a big departure from before. By the time Demolition came out, many fans did feel that the band's sound had become too experimental, too heavily influenced by modern trends. Halford came out as gay in 1998, and Halford and Priest announced that it was time for a reunion in 2003 and toured again in 2004. Despite Owen's obvious talent, the Ripper did not stand a chance against the metal god. And in more ways than one, the album Angel of Retribution symbolized that Judas Priest was indeed rising once more. Despite the old school sound, however, the band did not refrain from experiments. 2008's Nostradamus became a symphonic power metal concept album that split the fan base, most either loving or hating it. Yet it also showed that Halford, Tipton, Hill and Downing despite their advanced years, still had it in them to focus on everything that makes Judas Priest great. However, with K.K. Downing retiring from the band in 2011 and Glenn Tipton sadly revealing in 2018 that he had been diagnosed with Parkinson's and would no longer tour, the band's old school live lineup was cut in half with Halford and bassist Ian Hill left. But Firepower, their 18th studio album, was their first to crack the UK top 10 since British Steel. So after a 50 year long journey through heavy metal, the band goes on as strong as ever, still touring and still rocking. Priest is an unrelenting metal machine. If you have a chance to see them live,
Don't hesitate. Do it. 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 As you can see, Joachim, I'm wearing a Judas Priest shirt. Now, this is not actually mine. This is my fiance's shirt. I had a lot of band shirts. She has more band shirts. She's got, I mean, she's got dozens of awesome band shirts and stuff. And we wear the same stuff. Is that the real vintage stuff as well? It's, it, this is a nice one. Cool. I like she's it. had this for a while. You can tell it's a little washed out and stuff. Come I can't on. help seeing that you're not wearing a Judas Priest shirt. I can't take you anywhere. Literally, I can't take you anywhere. I'm so sorry, man. Cut! If there is one thing all band members in Sabaton have common, it's that era of heavy metal and music, yeah. I think. I mean, we started out back in the day drinking beer, and I think one of the most played albums was Judas Priest Painkiller. I mean, not only that one, but... Uh, and yeah, even from all the members up until today, that classic 80s metal, that's the common ground we have. It's kind of hard not to like it. I mean... Yeah, it's... it's no, I mentioned in the episode, like, you know, uh, um, Living After Midnight was the first Judas Priest song I heard, and it was on the radio. The thing is, that, that, that station that called itself, like, Houston's rock station, KLOL, looking back, I mean, they played, like, it was like Fog Hat and Triumph and April. It wasn't, like, fucking rock. <laughs> Except, but they played, they played Living After Midnight, and it, was, it sounded totally different from everything else they played, which was cool. You know? oh, that must be soft, that was the hardest stuff they that did. Was, it was the hardest <laughs> stuff they did, but it was a mainstream commercial FM station. It just called itself, it was K-L-O-L, so K-1-O-L, it was, you know, you know, rock and stuff. Have you guys ever covered a Judas Priest song? Yes, we have. We did this uh, All Guns Blazing, but also earlier in our career, one of our first covers was Jawbreaker. By okay, Priest, wow. from Screaming for Vengeance, and, uh, I think. And you've recorded that? Yes. Okay. I mean, we played with them a couple of times as well, I think. The first time was, ooh, it was a couple of years ago, but it was in Berlin, yeah. and we had a support show, and we were not announced okay. uh, as a special guest to that show. Okay. So nobody sort of knew we were coming, and uh, on that day, of course, uh, there's a flight uh, strike uh, among the airlines. I think it was Lufthansa or whatever, yeah. and our plane didn't depart. So the day before, when it, we, it didn't look like they were gonna, you know, get along and sort it out, we got a hold of a tour bus and started driving from Falun to Berlin because wow. we had no idea if yeah. we were gonna make it. And then we got caught on, you know, traffic accidents and caught behind them. So, and this is how cool the Judas Priest people and production were, is that they knew we were late because we were in constant contact with them, but they did everything to make it as easy as possible. So when we arrived at the venue, the doors had opened. So they had let people into the arena, but not into the concert okay. you know, yeah. space yeah. itself. And they had just sort of placed out everything um, for us. So yeah. you know, here's the you know, multi for the drums and all the cables. So we plugged in like crazy. Just plug you know, and play. We, we just yeah. slammed everything in, ran into the dressing room, and as soon as we did that, you know, changed our clothes, that's when they let people into the hall, and then we started playing. And it was a really yeah. uh, stressful day, but so fun, because, you know, we didn't have time to get really nervous. Yeah. No chance. What did people think of you guys being there? You know? uh, it was so fun, because when we announced, nobody knew that Sabaton was coming. Yeah. And uh, by that time, I think this is about 2010 or something yeah. like that, so we had... Uh, uh, got to know following in Germany already. So yeah. there were quite a few people. There's a bit of crosstalk between Sabaton and Judas Priest. If you right. like Judas Priest, you could like Sabaton. Yeah, and, you know, it's not a stretch. And we were heavily inspired by them. Yeah. So uh, we just went on stage and had a, had a great time. And Rob Halford had a birthday that day, I remember. Okay. Yes. Uh, I think I have a picture of the birthday cake. Uh-huh. Can we get that?
There we go. Yeah. Wait, what year is this you said? Like 2010, you say? Yeah. So that wasn't too long after they did Nostradamus, which is has a lot of symphonic stuff. Oh, that makes perfect sense to have you guys going together. That'd be really cool. Yeah. But the story, the story of Sabaton and Judas Priest, that wasn't the ending of it there, was no, it? No, no, no. There is a, there's another <laughs> chapter in this book upcoming, is it not? Not yet written. Can you, can you, can you tell them, tell the people about this, this upcoming saga? You sound like a preacher. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can you tell these people the upcoming saga of Sabaton and Judas Priest? Oh, yes. Put your hands up to the television set right now. I see a man, I see a man in Sundsvall that needs a new kidney. I see Put your hands up to the TV set right now and give till it hurts to the church of Sabaton and Judas Priest. How's that? Is that okay? <laughs> So, I'd, be, I'd be a good minister. I think I'd be a good minister, you know? I go to that church. Yeah. I'm and sorry. Write in the comments if you go to that church and, you know, maybe we'll make it happen. I'm not especially religious, but, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of people involved in the world of religion who aren't especially religious, and I know I'm going to get a lot of shit for that. But, 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 uh, but tell them the next chapter. Yeah, well, over the years we played uh, together a couple of times, and now we are doing a proper tour together in uh, North America. So United States and Canada, if I'm not mistaken. And when is this tour going to take place? September, October, and early November. So, uh, um, this year, 2021? Yes. I almost said 2020. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. There's one year that doesn't exist there, you know, almost. Yeah. No, but I'm really looking forward to it because it's, you know, one of our favorite bands we're touring with and also to get back on the road again. Yeah. It's, yeah, this is uh, one of the tours I've been looking forward to the most. Ever? Th ever in our career, actually. That's cool. Uh, well, I ho hopefully I'll be in the States at some point during that, because I, I would really enjoy seeing, seeing, seeing you guys together. That you should. Uh, that I should. We are playing in quite heavily in Texas. Yeah, you're playing in Houston then, yeah? I think so. I can't uh, well, I'll talk to you about the dates, and I'll see if I can, you know, time. Because I haven't been to see, I, I grew up in, Houston, for those of you who don't know. And I haven't been to see any family there since January of last year. I usually go like once a year. And my brother turned 50 in that time and I couldn't go to see his 50th birthday mm. stuff. So, uh, hell yeah. And none, nobody in my family's met my fiance because she, ah. she lives here and they live there. Well, they met, met her on, on the internet. Ah. So, uh, Love yeah. the video and, and she's, she's a, she's Meet a, my girlfriend. But she's a big Judas Priest fan too. So that would <laughs> Obviously. be- Obviously. So, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. But that, that'd be fun. Okay. Well, maybe I'll see some of you guys out there uh, in Houston at the uh, Sabaton Judas Priest show or, or Houston or Austin or Dallas or wherever it is. Yeah. I know we're doing uh, Austin, San, San Antonio, Dallas, and I think Houston, but I can't remember for sure. Okay. Because, you know, the tour has been rescheduled and oh, yeah. all of these dates okay. sort of- Yeah, change. but if I'm heading all the way there from Sweden, then it's not a big stretch for me to go from Houston to Austin. No. So, no, I might complain a bit, you know, <laughs> but- so. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Wait, well, if you think I'm going now, you're mad. You got another thing coming. Oh. You see what I did there? You see what I did? Yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. See, they're smiling. There's some smiles out there. I mean, not that we have any crew because of Corona. I'm just pointing where they would be. Yep. All right. Uh, all right. Well, that is all for today from us here at Sabaton History. Yeah. All right, everyone, that's it for this week. So remember to click that bell. It's really important. Click it now. And then, hope to see you again in the near future. Bye-bye. <laughs>